semblanza del doctor Asmi. En 1992, con un trabajo sobre geología de carbonatos y geoquímica de baja temperatura, el doctor Asmi obtuvo su grado de maestro en ciencias por la Universidad de Windsor en Ontario, Canadá. Cinco años más tarde, en 1997, obtuvo su grado de doctor en el área de geoquímica de la Universidad de Ottawa. El doctor Karen Asmi tiene amplia experiencia en la génesis de la porosidad, particularmente en la microporosidad de yacimientos carbonatados en arrecifes. Ha tenido distintos cargos relacionados con la docencia e investigación en diagénesis de carbonatos y en la aplicación de la geoquímica para reconstruir historias de sepultamiento de sedimentos y en controlar la estratigrafía de alta resolución en sus sesiones con pobre control bioestratigráfico. En enero de 2005, deja la Universidad de Basel, de Suiza, para unirse a la Universidad Memorial, en Newfoundland, como profesor asociado en caracterización de yacimientos. El doctor Asmi tiene un registro sólido, más de 120 publicaciones científicas, internacionales de alto impacto. Su investigación actual se enfoca en entender los controles de cementación en yacimientos arenoarcillosos y carbonatados por medio de la combinación de análisis geoquímicos y petrográficos. Le damos la bienvenida, es un honor tener al doctor Asmi. Por favor, doctor. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here. I'm going to talk today about the applications of the geochemistry in the genesis of sedimentary rocks. Just to give you an idea about what the genesis is, we, ident we identify the genesis as changes that occur to sediments at or near surface, put at or near surface conditions and then above the realm of close graded metamorphism associated with the changes, um, the diagenesis is always associated with changes in cartography and also in geochemistry. The most important petrographic changes in carbonates are the recrystallization and cementation. The marine carbonates like skeletal, non-skeletal or cements, these are the main types of carbonates we find them in the rocks, are precipitated mainly as aragonite, or high metalside. Both of these are metastable phases of the calcium carbonate, but rarely it is precipitated as low metalside. So the majority of the carbonates in the ocean are just aragonite, the majority of the mineralogy, aragonite or high metalside. They are stabilized uh, to low metalside during the curic diagenesis and also in the deep barrier settings when the sediments are taking are taken to deep barrier cities. And this happens through the recrystallization and the, the water rock interaction. And all the aragonite and hydrocarbon side, the metastable phase, is repla are replaced by the normal mesen calcite, low calcite, we call it like an abbreviation. And this is the stable phase of carbonate. All the carbonate cements in the meteoric and deep barrier settings are therefore low calcite or sometimes dolomite if we're talking about carbonates. So you can't find cement in the historic environment or deep barrier setting or like, uh, like aragonite or uh, like the marine, marine aragonite or marine fiber cement. It has to be low magnesium calcite. The most important petrographic changes in the plastic rocks <laughs> and also, I mean here the sand stones in general, uh, well, we see the carbonate cementation in the plastic rocks, like in the sand in the sandy stones. We see carbonate cements, and those types of sandy stones are similar to the same types of carbonates. So they are, they, this is why they are characteristic of the diagenetic environment. So when we see the uh, cements and carbonate environment, we know that they tell us about this is marine environment, this is meteoric environment, this is the barrier environment, for example. If I see cement like uh, fibers, marine cement, I say this is marine one. If I see uh, widow's cement, or uh, this is meniscus cement, I know right away this is widow's cement or the meteoric environment. 
if I see blocky cement or saddle to remind, I, I know right away, I'm looking at deep barrier settings, deep barrier uh, environment. I see the same thing, you, you see the same types, for example, also if you see for topic cement in the deep and uh, the carbonates, this reflects the deep barrier settings. So it's the same thing, the same types of cements we see them in the silicic plastics. So they characterize the environment of, uh, of barrier there, the diagenic environment. Another um, criteria, criteria that we look at in the carbonate box here, or the sedimentary rocks, we look at the fluid inclusions because they tell us about the, the origin of the carbonate cement. So the fluid inclusions in general, as you know, they are vacuoles sealed within the minerals. So in other words, these are like um, traces of the fluid from which the cement precipitated and that that fluid is trapped into a vacuum inside the cement. The primary fluid inclusions are in general time capsules, storing information about the temperature, the pressure, and the salinity of the diagenetic fluids. The homogenization temperature of the primary two-phase fluid inclusions are estimates of the minimum entrapment temperature of that cement. Of course, you know in the in the cement in the carbonate cements, you will find two types of fluid inclusions, all liquid inclusions, and these are formed at or near surface temperature, something at below 50 Celsius, or you find two phase fluid inclusions, and this is like a fluid inclusion with a fluid inside and a vapor bubble, and these are formed at temperature higher than the 50 degrees or the 60 degrees in the deep barrier settings. Then we look at the diagenetic geochemical changes in the carbonates. The diagenesis always results in enrichment and depletion of some elements and isotopes in the secondary phase of calcite. So we might start with primary calcite with probably strontium around 2000 ppm, manganese around 50 ppm, iron around 300 ppm. You will end up with, in the secondary calcite, in the cement of the altered carbonate, you get strontium generally less than 600, manganese more than 100, iron more than 500. So you see there are elements that are enriched in the diagenetic phase, others, they are depleted. Sodium is always depleted with diagenesis. Magnesium, it depends. If it's dolomitization, it will be enriched. If it's not dolomitization, just recrystallization, so magnesium will decrease. Zinc is enriched generally, but the enrichment is minimum, very minimal. And again, magnesium can be increased or decreased. It depends on if it's dolomitization or just recrystallization. But at the same time, all the way, the delta oxygen 18 and the delta carbon 13 of both of them in the primary phase, they get depleted or they decrease with diagenesis. Yeah. So they are depleted in the secondary phase. Of course, the slope of the depletion here, slope of the uh, reg uh, regression here is a bit exaggerated. It's usually not very deep like this. It is usually something like this. Why? Because the diagenetic fluids do not usually have that much carbon dioxide to reset the delta carbon 13 in the carbonates. So not, not that much carbon dioxide resolved in the diagenetic fluids. And this is why the delta carbon 13 might be it, um, like staying as near primary signature despite the alteration, a significant alteration in the delta oxygen of the carbon. We look also at the cathodic luminescence of the carbonates because this is a good uh, tool for identifying a generation of cements. The basic concept of the cathodic luminescence is we hit, you know, the carbonate cement with um, electron beam under vacuum. And then this excites the electrons in some of the elements in uh, replacing the calcium and the calcite crystal. This makes the electrons jump to the higher level or higher um, energy level in the atom. 
that the victims do not stay that, that long there. They come back to their ground state and they lose the energy that gained when they got excited. That energy gained during the excitation is called quanta or quantum. The, the electrons, when, when they come back to the ground level, ground uh, energy level, they lose that quanta in form of luminances. That's basically the concept of luminance. There are elements in the, in the calcite that enhance the luminescence. There are other elements that do not enhance the quench the luminescence. For example, iron, it quenches the luminescence, it makes the luminescence value, but with manganese, it enhances the luminescence, it makes the luminescence very bright. This is why the molar ratio of iron over manganese is the ratio that controls the luminescence in carbonate. We see luminescence patterns in those carbonates like uh, zooming, concentrated zooming, and this helps us to identify the different generations of cements under microscope. When we see, we look at those cements under photographic microscope, under plain polarized light, or even cross beakers, we see just all, of, all the cements are like each other. If they are like all blocky cements, we look, they are like each other. But when we put them under, uh, category analysis, we start to see probably two generations of those cells, not one generation, depending on the luminescence of those cements. This helps us to identify the phases of cementation, cement generations, I mean, and to evaluate the degree of preservation also of shell fossils. If I look at shell fossils like black hippot shell, secondary layer, and I see it null luminescent and it has, it keeps the fibrous structure. I will know right away that there was no uh, alteration for that. Our alteration did not affect significantly impact that second layer of the brachypod shell. And I can use the chemistry of that brachypod shell for reconstructing the very environmental conditions. Okay, I'm showing you here some examples of the, the cements under cathodic lessons and look at that Chevron sign, those bright lines that Chevron sign. Here too, and here too, and we see them here too, and here. These are characteristic of that dolomite generation that we see here under templarized light. Well, the, this means that these are from different depths in a core, and this tells us that this, these cements were precipitated by the same imaginative flow throughout the entire core. It's one phase of cementation. They belong to one phase of cementation. Well, probably the best thing to explain biogenesis is just to look at case studies and see how they, are, they were handled and how the, uh, the studying the diagenesis, diagenetic cements help to identify the diagenetic history of a disease. The first case of a study, a case study will, uh, we see here is the origin of middle upper Cambrian dolomites in eastern Laurentia. A case study from Bell Isle Strait. This is Western Newfoundland. It was done by one of my master's students. His name was Noel Shindiro, and it was published in 2021 in Marine and Petroleum Geology. And, and this is the actual citation. It's volume number 125, and this is the, the number of the paper. If we look here, we see this is the location of the Bell Isle. It is exactly here. It's a core grid in here. In the Bell Isles, uh, the, uh, the far north of Newfoundland. This is Newfoundland. This is this is, island is called Newfoundland, and this is the main land of Canada and this is the United States. And here is the location of that shield. And you can see here the the top pit and the stratigraphy of the core. It's mainly here the upper part is Dolomites, and uh, when we go down, we see. The deeper we go, we see the, the frequency of appearance of shield increase and sandstones too. Piston petrography, there were three generations of experiments uh, where, uh, where I identified the, the first generation is called V1. I call it V1. It is dolomicrite and it is fabric retentive, which was here in green polarized, as you can see here. Fabric retentive, it's, it's, it, the fabric is preserved there. The size of the grains between 4 to 35 microns. It uh, contains 
visual estimates comprising the entire quarry about 55%. The second generation there or second type of dolomite there, what I call the B2, and it has crystal size between 60 to 150, calibrated about 40% of the total content of the dolomite there in the core, and it consists of that sub to a hydra uh, crystals. They have cloudy cores and clear rims. And in fact, they are fabric destructive, so you can trace the fabric in that type of dolomite. They appear non luminescent under the scope, so you can see nothing but something black, something like the D3 here at the most. The D3 here, the D3 is just the blocky cement here. It, it, the crystal size reaches even more than 0.5 millimeter and calibrate about 5% on the total types of dolomites. It is fracture filling dolomite or rock filling dolomite, and it is mainly saddle dolomite with the characteristics feed the extension or unrealized extension that you know about. And it appears under microscope dull, under cathode mesis dull, as you see here. If you look here, it's dull releases. The D1 dolomite is the D3 almost non emission but not even dull. But the, the D1 is the dull one that we can call it dull. It has some. We looked at the fluid inclusions and you know, we always express the homogenization temperature in the histograms. And these are the homogenization temperatures of the two phase primary fluid inclusions in D2, D3 and also in C3, because there was a late generation of C3 occurred after B3. There was another uh, cement, another calcite cement came after B3. Well, I summarize the homogenization temperature here in B2, B3, and, B, and C3, the mean value plus or minus the standard deviation, and below here is the range. You'll find it here, 878 to 100 Celsius here, 96 to 126, and here is 93 to 118. Of course, the dolomicrite is micrite, is micritic. Well, what we can't measure fluid inclusions in a crystal like around four microns, or even 30 microns, you know, because the fluid inclusion in that crystal will be how many microns? Four microns, one micron, two microns, you cannot measure that. From the melting points, one can build up the salinity estimates of the salinity and when we plot the homogenization temperature like in the salinity we can see and the, the generations of the mice if we have if the overlap or not and we can see that there is some overlap here particularly between the c3 and b3 because they were the latest generations of cements but b2 is a little bit you know has it has the the lower homogenization temperature, but if we look at the salinity, the salinity is just the, the over, all of them, the overlap in the salinity. This may suggest that we originated almost, almost from the steam pipe fluid that its composition got um, uh, evolved through circulation in the base. Strontium, uh, strontium concentrations or molar ratios of strontium over calcium can be used to understand the origin of the nature of the diagenetic fluid. We will try here to understand the nature of the very early, um, uh, fluid, the nature of the very early tolopasm fluid that caused the precipitation of V1 or developed the V1. The equation is the molar ratio in the dolomite equals distribution coefficient multiplied by the same ratio in the dolomitizing fluid. We can calculate the molar ratio of the dolomite by analyzing the dolomite in the strontium and calcium elemental analysis. And with the distribution coefficient of the strontium, it has a value between 0 0.015 to 0 0.06. This is lab determined in the lab. Then we can calculate the molar ratio of the dolomitizing fluid. In, that, in this study, the, the molar ratio of D1, the parent fluid of D1, was found to be about 0 0.0036. Well, the molar ratio of the seawater is about 0 0.008. In fact, the molar ratio of strontium over calcium for the seawater did not change dramatically through the history 
the jewelry history data. This means that I'm looking here at molar ratio of the dermatizing current fluid of the one lower than that of the ratio of the seawater. This can tell that the dolomitizing fluid was not pure seawater, but seawater that got diluted by another type of water. So it is likely a mixture of pituric and seawater together that created the parent dolomitizing fluid of the one. When we plot the delta oxygen against the delta carbon 13, we will look at the ranges of composition and we compare them to the best preserved carbonates of the same age of the middle upper cavern. This, the, that, that range was taken from Visor Eterna 1999 and was based on the best preserved bracky poles there. And you can see that part of those, or the majority, of uh, for the majority, most of the samples of the study dolomites, they have a carbon, little carbon 13 composition exactly falling within the range of the best preserved uh, carbonates. But of course, you know, the delta O18 is a little bit more enriched. This is not strange because dolomitization is always associated with enrichment in the delta oxygen 18. This is a mineralogical factor that controls the data oxygen uh, when during dolomitization. Well, from the equation by Lane in 1983, it relates the temperature to the delta O18 of the fluid, and also it is the delta O18 of the dolomite. If you know the delta O18 of the dolomite and the temperature of dolomitization, you can calculate the delta O18 of the parent dolomitizing fluid. Let's look here. We know the delta, the, the temperature of dolomitization from the homogenization temperatures of the cement, cement lapidum line P2 and B3. And we know the delta, we know the delta O18 the delta from the, we measured the lab, the dolomite, and we know now the homogenization temperature from the fluid enclosures, we can get an estimate for the apparent diagenetic fluids. And we can see them at something between plus one to plus four, uh, to plus, plus one to plus probably three or so, another one, plus two, or plus three to plus four. So the overlap, and we can see the composition here is overlapping, suggesting that they got created almost from the same diagenetic fluid that its isotopic composition just evolved with progressive barrier. However, D1, we don't have an homogenization temperature from the fluids there simply for one reason, because D1 was formed, it's dolomicrite, definitely it was formed at near temperature conditions, and it's impossible to have two phase fluid inclusions there. You will always see if there were fluid inclusion, there were there would be probably all liquid inclusion. But the crystal size there does not allow us to, to pick up inclusion there and measure them. So assuming that they were formed probably at temperature between say 25 and 30, this will give us and this is an assumption, um, Delta O18 in a small for the parent diagenetic fluid between minus five and minus ten. Well, can we verify if this if our assumption is something really valid or not? Yes, we can. Well, let's go back to the best preserved delta carbon 13 signature for the middle upper cambium. We were probably between minus seven and minus eleven. Well, if we go and apply the same concept that we see here for dolomite, but we apply it for calcite, and there is an equation for calcite made by Friedman, O'Neill and Friedman, 1977. So take the best preserved carbonates during the middle upper uh, Cambrian. We got it from uh, Visor, 1999. And we looked at the fluid or the seawater from which we precipitated if the temperature was between 25 to 30 degrees. We found that the seawater should be around that time between minus four and minus seven. Well, if this is the case, then during uh, our present day in the, in the tropical environment, 
And these sediments that we are looking at seem to be really tropical environment. In the tropical environment, the rainwater is usually about four per million less than that of the seawater. And this means that the range for the meteoric water during the upper middle can middle upper Cambrian was between minus eight and minus eleven, because minus four, minus four should be minus eight, minus seven and minus four should be minus eleven. Now take the maximum, which is the best. Uh, signal or uh, most richest signal of the seawater, which is minus four, and take the most depleted signal coming from the meteoric water minus 11. Plot them here or mark them here, you find them. They are bracketing with the delta OEP values that we got it here around minus five to minus 10 through our estimate that the temperature of dogmatization was between 20 and 25 degrees. So this means that the air diagenetic fluid was likely a mixture of seawater and meteoric water. And this is what this is the story that I told you a moment ago. Now let's look at the normalized um, normalized values or patterns of the D1, D2, and D3, and see how they behave. You can see that. All of them here, they are missing the negative serial anomaly characteristic of water, of course, because of the mixing with the other fluids, particularly the meteoric water. But we see something here, like there is some sort of positive European anomaly. This is coming from the dissolution of the plagioclase with spars. In fact, the diagenic fluids pass through probably base nut sediments, this plastic sediments. I reacted with the feldspars there in those sediments, since this is a classic sediments, and this is what caused the enrichment in Europium and caused the Europium and on the positive Europium. If we take the small tips of those types of dolomites and we break them down under vacuum in a mass spectrometer and we measure the nitrogen, the argon carbon dioxide and methane, and we take the ratio of carbon dioxide over methane, again, it's the ratio of nitrogen over argon, and we find here this, this is the, this actually diagram was established by somebody called Norman in New Mexico, he passed away now. And from the ratio of these gases, we can know the type of the diagenetic fluid, if it had contributions from magma or from other things, but we can find that everything here is basically crustal, meteoric, and here's some enrichment coming from organics. This is why uh, they were enriched in organic matter. This is why the nitrogen is a little bit high because it's coming from the proteins and amino acids of the organic. And this is why we see here some enrichment in the ratio of nitrogen over R. So the whole thing here is just crustal phase, like seawater mixed with meteoric water. In summary, the Bell Isle dolomites have three generations of dolomite, the fabric retentive dolomite, dolomicrite D1, the mid barrier sucroid dolomite D2, and the lead barrier fracturing fitting dolomite D3. The fabric retention, uh, the delta O18 and the molar ratio of the D1, all of them together, suggest an origin from, as I said, no mixture of meteoric and marine waters. And the homogenization temperature and the estimated delta O18 value of D2 and D3 are consistent and suggest precipitation from hot fluids, the barrier fluids, and the real earth elements suggest development from some dolomitizing fluids that their elemental chemistry evolved by circulation through the basin sediments. The case study number two, it's the origin of carbonate cements and the Flemish basin sand store reservoir. And we will look at the controls of the process development. So this is another example, but in this case we are using and uh, we are applying the same concept, but to the silicic elastic rocks. This study was done by one of my master's students. Xiongi is now in Husky Oil in China, and it, pub it was published in 2016, and the citation is here. It was in uh, volume 70, page 
which is 93 to 180. Well, the study area, it is in fact in eastern Newfoundland, offshore Newfoundland, and uh, it is called the Flemish Pass Basin, here in Jean Rock Basin, the big basin here. And this is here the Flemish Pass Basin, a close up of its location. This is the lithostratigraphy of the of the seven of the sandstone, it's a flowy marine sandstones here, and it's actually at the topmost part of the Jurassic, close to the Jurassic Cretaceous down there. Well, the petrography, in fact, we, we selected some samples and ran them on the mineral liberation analysis uh, software. This is a software you know, installed. Uh, on scanning it to a microscope, you leave the slides overnight and we scan the entire slide. Next morning, we tell you the percentage of each mineral there in that slide, like with felspar, plagioclase, orthoclase, uh, how much quartz there. So it does everything. And we, based on the results, we found that it is sublitharinite and it is fine to medium angular to subangular, moderately sorted grains. The quartz greens are mainly, the detrital tetri quartz are mainly monocrystalline. They are not polycrystalline. It means that the source of rock is mainly igneous rock rather than metamorphic. And the plagiar glazes are mainly, uh, and the flispars are mainly plagiar glaze flispars, albite, that show the solution replacement by carbonates. The sedimentary lithic fragments are silty stones, bronze stones, and shale. The carbonate fossil shells are common there. And since they were aragonite shells, as we will see later, heavy minerals exist in the Arcade and they are dominated by tourmaline, zircon, and rutil. These are probably some uh, photomicrographs of the sandstones there, and you see the components. This is some algae here, some pertite, and, uh, and you see here some pore, big pore here, also here, albite. And micro clean here, something like this. So it's all the components that we talked about. And the in, in here we see a scattered, back scattered area, and that shows you know, also the, uh, some of the um, components of the, of the sandstones there. This is like, uh, it shows also the secondary pros. As you see here, PR it means a pore. So lots of pros there. And, and it is obvious that these pores were, were uh, were developed by uh, uh, secondary pores developed by dissolution of the carbonate cement that that precipitated the area. Again, we can see here another backscatter diagram with the pleasure place clear here, and this is calcite. You see the replacement of the pleasure place by the calcite. Up to about 47% calcite cements here, and they are varying between sparry and perculotopic calcite, and they show bright CL, as you can see on the right hand side here. And also, there are late fractures, and they were filled by cement. And there, are, there is rare iron rich dolomite there filling some of these cements there, filling some of the fractures there. Okay, this is uh, a diagram showing that the primary porosity got destroyed mainly by the cementation and the secondary porosity were many molded and created by the dissolution. Well, they, this, is, this is a common you know, technique or graph. We do it to evaluate the type of the site and the origin of porosity. When we looked at the microthermometry, we found that there were intergranular cements, and they were like uh, they had the first. They, they were all liquid flints there in the core, in the, in the core of the uh, intergranular cement. This tells us that the cementation started at the early stage of the genesis, 
probably at near surface conditions, temperature less than 60 or less than 50. And the, the grams of those cements, they have two phase fluid inclusions. So it's that the, the cements grew with progressive barrier and in the rim, the, the, there were primary two phase fluid inclusions. The homogenization temperature there was probably around 70 degrees plus or minus five and they varied between 64 to 81. And the fracture filling cements, they had homogenization temperature about 130 seven degrees, max, minimum 133 and maximum 138. While well, calculating from the melting point, the, uh, oh, well, actually, and let's look here better at the delta carbon 13 and delta oxygen 13 of those cements, you will find that the, um, that the fracture cement were were not very common. They are they were rare, and the and the inter, intergranular cements there, they have delta oxygen and delta carbon thirteen very close uh, to the to that. Um, oh well, actually not very. They are a bit at the margin at the on the rigid side of the delta O eighteen, but the the fracture cement is on. The, on the depleted side there because of the high temperature, of course, homogenization temperature. But if you look at the delta carbon 13, you find them, they are overlapping. So there is no difference in the delta carbon 13. This, of course, you know, as I said, because the diagenetic fluids never, not ever, rarely have high carbon dioxide dissolved in them to reset the delta carbon 13 signature. Well, we apply, because these were calcites, they were not dolomite, we apply the, the equation of the calcite by Fred Manano in 1977, and from the homogenization temperature, one can, can estimate the delta O18 of the parent fluid. It's between probably minus two or so and plus 10. And obviously, you know, the, the higher the temperature, the heavier the delta O18 of the parent fluid, because, you know, the fractionation decreases with increasing temperature, fractionation of oxygen isotopic fluids. So the oxygen 18, the lower the temperature, the oxygen 18 will go the, the heavier phase, which is the cement, the diagenetic phase. But uh, when the temperature goes up, you know, the oxygen 18, which is the heavier phase, stays in the light phase, which is the liquid. It doesn't go to the um, to, to the cement. So the all liquid flanks in the cores of the cement, and which cement A here, we suggest, suggest that cementation started, as I said you know, a moment ago, in shallow barrier setting. And the delta O18 you know, of that cement A was between minus 11 and minus 5, and significantly lower than that of the late Jurassic preserved delta O18 carbonates between minus 1.5 and plus 5. The intergranular calcite precipitated, in fact, Based on these, it should be precipitated from modified marine water, mixed and meteoric water of Nuvio marine environment. The fracture filling cement, we call it the paper cement B, precipitated in deeper barrier settings at higher temperature, as was indicated by the homogenization temperature. Let's look again here at the rare earth elements patterns, and you can see again. The cerium anomaly doesn't exist here because of mixing with the meteoric water and the occurrence, occurrence in suboxic conditions. So you can't have an, ox, an, an oxic or suboxic conditions cerium anomaly. It will be, it will, the cerium anomaly will be close to one or above one. But we can see again the same European anomaly. It's coming from the dissolution of the plagioclase feldspars during the reaction of the diagenetic fluids with those feldspars through the circulation in the basinal uh, siliciclastic sediments. We apply the same idea of the gas ratios to those cements. And in this case, we are dealing here with the cement A, not cement B. Cement B was fracture filling cement and was very rare. So the majority was the, the intergranular cement. And you can, as you can see, they are crustal or evolved crustal uh, fluids. So it means that they were like a mixture of those marine water trapped in between the grains and the meteoric water because it's a fluvial marine environment. In summary, the sandstone unit, it's called TI3, that it was Tithonian of the 
Bodran formation consists of quartz arenite and sublit arenites, uh, dominant with plutopic intergranular cementation, delta O18 of the intergranular cement, uh, coupled with the fluid, fluid inclusions gas analysis. And the poor negative serum anomaly may suggest that that calcite cement is precipitated in suboxic conditions from modified marine fluids, influx, and influx of meteoric uh, water and rivery water. The microthermometry and the delta O18 of the calcite values of, and of the fracture cement, fracture filling cement, suggest precipitation from circulating hot basin fluids. The calcite cements are the main factor control, controlling that reservoir quality and the higher porosity horizons were found in fact attached or close to the uh, rich organic rich silt stone layers which means that part of these uh, pores there was caused by the organic acids produced from the thermal cracking of those organic matter and dissolve it, the calcite that filled in between the grains. And the secondary process, as I said, mainly moldic, formed due to the dissolution by acids, as I explained in a moment ago. By the way, I had a postdoctor who was actually my former uh, doctorate student who did work on the same area, and he found sometimes um, pores not associated with organic rich silt um, in, in the offshore New, Newfoundland. So uh, there are there is another factor of hydrothermal fluids that contribute to the positive. But in this case here of Xiong, well, I, what we found was only attached or associated with those organic rich silt stone interbits. The third case study, it's from diagenesis of the Racamorta formation. Racamorta, Racamorta formation is in Argentine in the Lekin Basin. And uh, it, uh, it, it is actually the same age like the Plutonian one, uh, the one in uh, the it's Jurassic Cretaceous, not GK, GK bound. And we got evidence from photography and microthermometry as well as geochemistry that supported our interpretation that we will discuss here. This was published, by the way, it was by Lenze Tell, she's uh, my PhD student, and was published in Marine Petroleum Geology in Volume 124, as you can see, and this is the citation. Well, this is the location of the Nikin Basin in Argentina, and this is the study area here. Well, this is the latest stratigraphy, as you can see, it's mainly carbonates, like mud stones, interbedding with some shields. And, um, and there were, I believe, two small, or few, not two, more than two, few, very few uh, sandstone interbeds in that sequence here. I don't know if they appear in the mythology or not. Okay, well, if we look. If we look at the samples in those carbonates, we find two generations of uh, the same thing. Uh, lime mudstone, microbial lime mudstone, it's, we call it C1, and C2, it's a recrystallized, it's a recrystallized lime mud, you know, which is C1, or fossils, and then there was a beef cement, you know, when there's a fracture, horizontal fracture opens, crystals just make like beef structure, like this, like fibers like this, and we call this beef cement. If you want to have more details on this, there is a publication by one of my uh, former resident PhD student, his name is Luan, that was on the beef, beef cement. And then the third type of carbonate generation there was the late fracture filling cement C3. And we have them all here, shown here, you know, under plain polarized, and here under cathode luminescence. Of course, C1 seems dull, beef cement, very bright, C3, which the latest carbon calcite fracture film cement, it is zoom. You can see it shows zooming, zoom, zoom cell. This is the paragenetic sequence, as you can see on the Manabada, it starts with the necritic or calcite solution, seems horizontal fractures, bitumen. Then the beef cement opening fractures and the horizontal fraction of the beef cement, then the vertical fractures, 
in the latest calcite cement, which is C3, followed by pyrotization, some minor pyrotization. Well, we went to C3. That's the only cement one that we managed to recall this honeymoon. Two phase field inclusions, primary two phase field inclusions. And we measured them and we, we plotted the histogram. And you can see there are two populations here of homogenization temperatures. This tells us that there was something that happened that brought the homogenization temperature to a lower level. So we will see later why this happened. I'm sure you, you started to figure out why this happened. Well, if we look at the strontium and manganese cross um, well, um, uh, scatter diagram, we can see here that all of them, they have uh, um, values below or around close to the 500 ppm strontium and a little bit below, but few samples from the C3 and C1, they, have, uh, they are above the 500. This can tell us that there were some um, aragonitic shells there. In the, in, the, in the sediments. Also, it could be a water rock, low water rock interaction ratio, not high water rock interaction ratio. So the depletion of the strontium was not very severe, but you can see still the enrichment of manganese is, is high. So it means the fluids were enriched with manganese. We put we plot the iron against manganese. You can see the manganese is usually around the 2000 or so, but the iron is too much high. So, again, if there was wear and rich, then iron, particularly for the C1 here. So, the enrichment of iron and manganese in C1 is due to the abundant bacterial pyrite in that, uh, in the lime one. This is why, you know, when you just micro drill, you cannot avoid. The, uh, the pyrite there, it's hard. And this means, you know, the, uh, the conditions were not that much oxygen. There were some, some dysoxic conditions. And there is wide, a wide range of use and iron, as I said, in the later cements reflecting the reduced conditions, like here, the C3 cement. Okay. The C1, it's microbial, as I said, microbial lime and stone. Here's the range of the plutonium seawater from the best preserved carbonates every 10 years. For the delta O18, it shifted towards more negative values. So there is some diagenesis there. It's not, uh, uh, we can see very, very low diagenesis. No, there is some diagenesis there. And you can see, as I say, you know, that there is overlap in the delta carbon 13 values. But the delta O18 values, uh, you know, we can see that the CB or the leaf cement is a little bit more depleted than the, than the C1, which is lime mud, and the fracture that the C3 is distinctively depleted with in delta O18 because of the formation at high temperature. Well, the, the, as I said, the delta carbon 13, they have manganese over uh, strontium, the, with manganese over strontium, you know, the, the ratio R about 0.03, there is no correlation to, you know, between the delta carbon 13 and manganese over strontium ratio. This means the delta carbon 13 ratio is preserved there. And also, the, there is some, there are some negative delta carbon 13 here. You can see them very negatively of the of carbon C1, which is the limestone. stone. This is likely by contributions from the bacterial degradation of the organic matter that released lots of probably like carbon dioxide and even minor alteration or uh, or recrystallization of that lime mud with that. Lots of carbon dioxide coming from the organic matter, degradation of organic matter can cause a you know, significant depletion in the delta weighting value. As you can see here, it's below minus two, minus four, minus six, minus eight. That's too much for the lime mud stool. It means that there was organic matter involved in this. So even under restricted diagenesis, if you have lots of carbon dioxide there, it will bring the delta carbon to the signature down. Well, then the negative delta oxy oxygen here, I said, contributions come from degradation also 
of the organic matter during the restricted digestion. So it could be the negative here. It's too, as I said, it's too much depleted compared with the best preserved delta, uh, delta, delta carbon 13 material of the titanium carbonate. You can see here delta carbon 13 close to minus eight or so. This is too much, you know. Um, uh, delta oxygen team, forgive me, it's minus eight or so for the lime on the stone, we get minus eight delta oxygen. No, this, this means some, this is, and it is like mud, it's not like the crystallization and big crystals you see in front of you, know, you see lime mud and still it's minus eight. Well, this means that you got some contributions from the organic matter, the degradation of the organic matter. Well, the delta carbon 13 also of the beef to the white, which is the beef, beef calcite, which is the cement in the horizontal fractures, is buffered, as I said, you know, by that of the surrounding carbonates. But you can see that the delta 18 is not buffered. No, it's, it's here. You see, it's, it's a bit distinctive and a bit deplete. Because it was formed at higher temperature than, of course, you know, the C1. And C3 is very distinctive, as I said from the beginning, it has a very distinctive negative delta oxygen 18. It's because of the homogenization temperature is the highest. Okay, well, as I said, you know, we apply the same equation of Friedman and the same concept. Delta O18 versus temperature, and then we take the uh, this is the delta oxygen of the calcite, the homogenization temperature of the C3 is between probably 100 and 145 or 140, something like this. So it, this gives, you know, delta O18 of the fluid around plus six to plus, say, you know, close plus eight or plus seven. And this is expected positive values expected for the hot fluids. Then it comes here, the problem where the C1 was to which is the line one. Uh, well, we can see here that the best preserved carbonates for the plutonium, if you get it from Visor in 1999, is between plus 0.5 and minus 1.5. But if we take those, uh, those values and we try to apply them to a curve similar to this to predict the delta weakening of the water, the seawater, we'll find, if you, even if you apply it here on the same curve view, Oh, it's in figure you find at 20, 25 degrees, T should give um, uh, water between sea water between say plus 2.8 and 1.8. So we're talking about the two and three generally. But all the delta O18 of the back mortar is between minus five and minus 10 for the C1, for the lime mother stone. Uh, this doesn't make it, it doesn't fit the here that you have any mixing of, of seawater or marine water. I think that's quite obvious. You have more depleted than that of this water with the isotopically light CO2 that came from the, the bacteria degradation or oxidation of the organic matter during the early biogenesis at the near surface temperature. And that's what caused, you know, that very depleted data of the lime mud, the lime mud stone. Okay. Now, same thing. Let's try to apply the rare uh, elements in you know, normalization to the post archaean Australian shield as we do always. Look, you see that the serial anomaly is almost gone. So it's not, it's not coming directly from water. So it's, uh, there's something new, you know. So possibly by different digenetic fluids or thermal medication, organic matter released aggressive acidic fluids there with distinct fair elements. And you see again the post urine anomaly, European anomaly, and it comes you know, from the plastics in the basin with the circulation of the digenetic fluids in the basin there. And they were, they, there are there shales, shale into beds and some sandstone in the beds. And uh, of course, you know, this will result in the dissolution of the pleasure cases there, and this will make the fluids enriched in uranium, in European, forgive me. Okay, this is again the serum anomaly here, the positive serum anomaly. 
along with the iron and the manganese, the investment supports reduced inflammations with progressive barrier and even desoxic conditions, you know, not very oxic conditions during the precipitation. And the lower cerium anomaly of the C3, this is the latest cement than those of the C of the reef cement. And the other ones, you know, this suggests you know, the possible uplift. And this is why we saw here, you see here, that graph, I showed you two populations of homogenization temperatures. So one of them has higher temperature, the other one has the temperature in the same latest cement C3, because part of the latest cement was formed at deep period setting, and there was uplift after that during the tectonic activity that caused, you know, the, 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 the formation of the other set of homogenization temperatures during the precipitation of the CP. And of course, this is reflected also in the cerium anomaly, the lower cerium anomaly of the C3, and this is the latest cement than that of those of the of the beef cement suggests the possible uplift too. So this confirms the idea of the uplift. In summary, the Bacamorta formation, carbonates there have four main generations of calcite: C1, the microbial mother, and the equivalent calcite C2, the fibrous calcite beef cement. And uh, this is the last one is the fracture of the cement, the trace elements, and the stabilized stocks coupled with the microthermometry suggests that C1 was deposited in tropical water, water environment and exposed to a significant meteoric alteration before the diagenesis. The C2 developed by the recrystallization of C1 and bioclast during an early diagenesis or near surface temperature and pressure, and the beef. The uh, calcite and the uh, C3, which is the fracture of the calcite, precipitated during mid to late barrier digenesis within the oil window because there were oil traces there in those cements. The total reality elements and the shape normalized better patterns and cerium and europium anomalies reflect low water rock interaction and prevalent reducing conditions induced by the high amount of the organic matter, the latest cement was C3, the fracture film, to have developed from C1 pair and diagenetic fluids that its geochemical composition evolved through the circulation into the surrounding basic sediments and the chemistry of the beef cement parent fluid was controlled by the alteration of the organic matter. In conclusion, the geochemistry also of the carbonate cements and the elemental and isotopic and fluid gas ratios retained by the primary fluid inclusions combined with petrography and microthermometry provide reliable tools for the reconstruction of the diagenetic history of the sedimentary hydrocarbon reservoirs and the stabilized isotopes along with the microthermometry allow calculations of the estimates of the isotopic composition of the parent diagenetic fluids of the cements and better understanding of their nature. The strontium contents are potential proxy for, for uh, of the nature of the early diagenetic fluids and the rare elements along with the sterium and European anomalies provide valuable information about the origin of the diagenetic fluids and the types of rocks through which they circulated contributions of results from the shell normalized rare earth patterns and microthermometry provides clues about the tectonic history of the base. Well, thank you so much. Any questions? Si alguien gusta hacer una pregunta, por favor, abra su micrófono. Very, very interesting the work. And I want to know if, if you find pyrite crystals on the Vaca Muerta. No, could you kindly raise your voice a little bit because I can't hear you. 
Did you find pyrite crystals on Baca Muerta? Did I find pyrite where? If you find pyrite on Baca Muerta. Pyrite microcrystals in the in the work of uh, I'll try to raise the um, the the sound a little bit. Forgive me because it's a bit low. So you said that did I try uh, did I found pyrite uh, in uh, with the, with what with the carbonates in the Baca Muerta? Yes. Did you find them? I think there were pyrites there. Uh, uh, there is. Um, have you read the paper by Capelli et al. Uh, uh, 2020, something like this, if I'm not mistaken, because he believes that the Bacamonte formation was precipitated during the high sea level. Um, it's a, um, it, wa it was during the high sea level. So, of course, you know, you would see there's some pyrite there associated with this. But I I didn't see that much in the ten section, but there were some pyrites based on the description by uh, Maria Maria Lenz. Uh, Maria was you, she said yeah there was some pyrite. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think this was the reason when the she micro drilled, you know, the samples she found that C1 um, had high iron and manganese. I, I will need to, sh to share the screen again in order to show you this. You want me to go back or you remember that, that graph? Alguna otra pregunta? Any other questions? Hi. Hi. I Hi. have a question, but um, it's more like theoretical. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, I noticed in all your uh, real earth elements graphics, Mm -hmm. uh, the European anomaly yeah. are constant, and it's it's uh, marked with the arrow that it's the uh, dissolution of feldspars. Yeah, what do you mean that constant? In most of those cases, I selected this. The European anomaly was clear yeah. because there were sandstones and um, and shales, silty stones, interbeds in the sequences. And the diesel and the recirculation or circulation of the diagenetic fluids within those sediments, the, the diagenetic fluids react with the feldspars, particularly the pleasure phase feldspars. And that reaction ends up with the um, uh, dissolved in the feldspars, and this pops up the ratio of the European. And this is why you get the European anomaly. Okay, so, so it's a, it's a um, repetitive constant that I'm going to find in another analysis? Of... Yes, if, you, if, you go, if, you, if you're working on a sequence or diagenesis of rocks that have those interbeds or underneath them, there were uh, plastic rocks, the diagenetic fluids pass through them, yes, you will see that European anomaly. And you will see them in the fluids coming from, uh, you know, the black smokers and the vents in the ocean, in the bottom of the ocean. They, you find them there high. If you measure the European, they find them high. Okay. They are they are associated with hydrothermal fluids, you know, coming through the, from the ocean at the bottom of the ocean, and of course, the pleasure places will form from magmatic yes. fluids. So you find them. Okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, there is a publication, you know, about this. Uh, uh, it's cited in Xiong and cited in. In lands and cited also in the in the paper of uh, of Shambilu. I don't remember. It's not on, at the end of at the head of my top uh, at the top of my head, but it, it's like two or two publications. You know, they are very common, very known. 
were very well known about this. One about the hydrothermal fluids and the other one about the, uh, the dissolution of feldspars. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, recently studying this, this geo, inorganic geochemistry, and, and this, this popped on my head too. Oh, okay. yeah. Great. Pleasure. Any other questions? ¿Alguna otra pregunta? ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Ok, si no hay más preguntas, entonces agradecemos el Seminario Universitario sobre Investigación en Hidrocarburos. Reconoce al doctor Karen Asmi por su destacada conferencia, Applications of Geochemistry in the Genesis of Sedimentary Rocks, a través de la cuenta de Zoom de la Secretaría de Desarrollo Institucional de la UNAM. Thank you very much for your interesting talk, Dr. Asmi. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you, everyone, for assisting. Leave me here.